right, Mike, the season has ended. That means the interviews are back. One of our favorite things about the show is getting a chance to talk to some former Knights, some some folks who were uh, a big part of the program, big part of the success of UCF. And uh, tonight, Mike, we are joined by, uh, not just because he's on the show, but you can attest to this, probably one of my favorite players on the team because I love saying his name at all times because he's got just a cool sounding name, something that very parliamentary, I think, in, in some respects. Uh, but this guy was also a beast on the field for for two straight seasons at UCF. Did it the right way, both on and off the field, Mike. Um, always fun when he was in front of the microphone, in front of the podium. And I'm glad we get a chance to talk to him tonight and get to know him a little bit better. It is our favorite, Walter Yates the third joins us on the Sons of UCF. Walter, first off, man, thanks so much for taking some time to uh, to join us. Hope you had a great holiday season. Yes, sir. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to join. I hope you all did the same as well. All right, let's get started. I always like to find out from the beginning how you end up at UCF, right? So you obviously were a, were a transfer from Savannah State. Uh, yes, you put your name in the portal. And how do you end up in Orlando? Take us through the journey to Orlando and UCF. Okay, so quick backstory. Uh, so it's probably my junior year at Savannah State. So the COVID season happened. And kind of around this time, I'm kind of thinking if I really want to go to the next level, I got to uh, kind of explore the portal a little bit. But I didn't quite hop into the portal yet my junior year. So COVID happens. So that following season, I uh, tore my bicep. So I missed my whole senior season. I tore my bicep like the first game of the season. So then that's kind of really, that's really when it hit me. And that was also my senior year at Savannah State. So I was graduating that year. So I was thinking I should, my plan at that point was to graduate, hit the transfer portal. So I go through rehab and all that. I uh, hit the portal, I want to say December, January, some sometime after the season. I can't remember the exact date, but I hit the portal. And I really didn't have much interest, to be honest. My main two schools that I was talking to was Middle Tennessee and UCF. But UCF didn't hit me up until a lot, lot later in the process. I really, I really was committed to Middle Tennessee. That was really where I was planning on going. I had official visit up there. I had met the coaches and uh, it's really a crazy story. I remember, I want to say the week, two weeks before I had to go up to UCF or not UCF, two weeks before I had to go up to middle Tennessee, the, uh, at the time, uh, Travis, Will, coach T will, he had called my dad and he was calling my dad a couple of times with my dad. He doesn't answer calls unless he like knows who's calling kind of deal. So he's like, this Orlando number keeps calling me. So, Thank God he answered that phone, for real. <laughs> Thank God he took the time to answer, and it ended up being T. Will. And he was saying how they had a, a linebacker opening, and uh, I should get out there and take a visit. But I was trying to tell him that I, at the time I was committed to Middle Tennessee. I didn't know how that was going to work. But it was just a verbal commit. It wasn't an official, like, paperwork or signed anything. So I still could go to UCF. So I ended up <laughs> taking the visit out of UCF, and I just fell in love with it. And I was a – as a kid, I was a – Big, still am, huge fan of uh, Coach Gus Malzahn. Like, I was a big Auburn, Cam Newton. So the moment was really just surreal, just sitting in his office and just meeting him. He's showing me the SBs and all this stuff, and it was just a total just, I was just say a dream, honestly. And uh, I just sat down and talked with him, and he was saying that if I chose to go with UCF, I would have an opportunity to play and make an impact on the team and, it's kind of history from then on. After that conversation right there, I went back home the next day. I called the Middle Tennessee coaches, decommitted, and then I committed to UCF, and I headed up there. I want to say that weekend, that weekend, uh, it's been history ever since. All right. I got to ask the important questions. Did T. Will not leave a message for your dad? Like, you feel like you leave a voicemail, and you're like, hey, it's <laughs> T. Will from UCF. Can you call me back? Was there no voicemail left or something? I actually... I want to say there probably was his voicemail. I'd have to I'd have to ask him. Okay. But I, would, okay. I would say there probably was a voice message. Because I'm thinking, yeah, call her ID, call her ID, yeah there's got to be a voicemail that says, "Hey, man, it's T. Will from UCF. Love to love to call you back." So when you, when you get on campus, right, and and yeah. you kind of walk around UCF, what struck you right away? Anything stick out to you as you kind of step, step foot on campus? So coming from Savannah State, Savannah State is a is a smaller HBCU kind of school. Is not, I would say, it barely has. Barely has maybe one to two thousand kids that go to the school, 
So I would say the first thing that struck my mind when I first got on campus was just how big it was, just how spaced out everything was and how you really had to drive to get to different places and just how they had the indoor, they had great facilities. It was just, this is the whole, I would just say everything about it just, just caught my attention, to be honest. You came in and you were able to contribute to the defense right away. How long did it take you to really get comfortable at UCF in, in the defense? Um, Let's see. So I will say that first year, I got pretty comfortable more towards the end of the first year, kind of going into, like, the Navy game. Um, That was, like, my first start. But kind of easing towards the end of the season, I was getting just familiar with it. I'm a big uh, – how do I put it? I'm big with like reps, like reps help me kind of figure out I'm big on like uh, game reps. Game reps are huge for me. So that Duke game, I would probably say kind of settled it for me. That's when I figured out that I was going to be kind of dominant in this defense. And just that's when I felt probably most comfortable towards the end of that season. And going into spring, I, I really honed in on what I needed to work on and what parts of the defense I needed to learn more. And I would say that really towards the end of the first season, I got pretty comfortable. So it took a while then because you came in right away and you were making yeah. plays from the beginning. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, that was more, uh, uh, I don't even know how to, I would just say God given ability. I would say, I wouldn't say I didn't know the defense, but I was, I got way more comfortable as the season kind of progressed, I would say. All right. So, but your, your first year on campus, you're a new guy on the team. You don't have any preconceived notions about the other players. There was a, a quarterback battle going right. into that season. Right. You got That's to play, go up against these guys on, on practice every day. What, what was harder for you to defend? The Mikey Keene or John Rice Plumley? How, how do you think that was going to play out going into the year? Uh, I would say all three of those guys. Tommy, or all four really, I guess. Tommy, Timmy, Mikey, John Rice. Also, they all four got something different that they add add to the uh, add to the table. Really, um, I really didn't know how that quarterback battle was going to turn out. I, I thought uh, Coach Manzano had one of the hardest decisions <laughs> to make, to be honest, because I thought, especially that spring going into uh, going into the summer after the uh, twenty two season, that was a very competitive uh, spring, and even fall camp at that too. That was very competitive, and I really didn't know. Who was going to win for real? But I would say all four of them are great quarterbacks, and they all bring some difference to the table. I would say. Was there? I know you, you came from Savannah State, obviously a smaller school. Was there a, a, a noticeable difference when you stepped on the field and playing at Savannah State versus playing at UCF? Was speed faster, guys bigger? Did you notice a difference, kind of in just in the way the game was played from from Savannah State to UCF? Uh, yes, 100%. Yeah, big difference. I would say, uh, the main, the main difference, I wouldn't even say size, I would say size is a big difference. And I would just say attention to detail. Like, you might be able to get away with stuff at a, at a lower, lower level, but I would say at the D1 level, like, you have to really hone in on details because, because everybody's watching film. You got GA analysts that are watching film and, telling you certain keys that you didn't really, I didn't really get that as Savannah State. We didn't have guys just watching film, telling us keys and helping us study those keys. So I'll just say the preparation at, at a D1 level is is huge. And that uh, doesn't go unnoticed, I would say. And that's probably the biggest difference. Well, take us through some of that 22 uh, season, right? I start off with the big win at South Carolina State, a tough exactly. loss at home to Louisville, which, you know, exactly. may or may not have been a holding penalty in Ryan Soboda. We can talk about that till we're blue. It wasn't a holding penalty, right? <laughs> I didn't think it was either. This okay, I, we're all on the same page there. Yes, and, and, yes, and then we're going through the season, and all of a sudden, well, just a clunker at ECU, a, a head-scratching 34-13 loss at ECU. Kind of a weird night. ECU is a, a weird place to play. As, right. as a player – like, take us into that game. Like, was there a point in time where you're – I'm not saying ECU wasn't a good team, but you're going through the right. motions. You kind of look up at the clock, and you're like, damn, like, we're losing this thing. Like, yeah. we, we got to step it up. Like, w walk me through kind of what you were thinking through the ECU game. Um, I would say that ECU game was – like you said, it was just a weird – it was a weird game. I would say ECU came out to play, though. I would say ECU came out very prepared for us. And I don't know – I'm not going to say we underplayed going into that game, but I would just say we were, we were kind of hot 
going into that game, and we were looking. I want to say, did we play Cincinnati after ECU? The very next week, yeah, Cincinnati. Right. Okay. So yep. I would say that kind of played into it. And I was, I'd say that's a lesson we learned too, not to underestimate any opponent and just take it week by week. Because I know we were really looking forward to the Cincinnati, to the Cincinnati game, just because of what I heard from the previous years and kind of a little rivalry between UCF and Cincinnati. So we were really looking forward to that week, and we just totally underlooked ECU, and they they came out to play. I remember uh, Keaton Mitchell. He plays for the uh, the Ravens now. Yeah. Real good player. I say he's a real good player. He stood out to me that game. And the quarterback, the quarterback was a real good dude too. I can't remember his name. Holt hey. Nailers. He he was probably forty yeah. when you guys played him. I think he'd been there like nine <laughs> years at that point. <laughs> yes, sir. He was. I do remember him being one of the older players out there. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he already has a 401k, but there was a there was a lot of rumors walled after that game. And I don't know what you know or what you what you want to reveal. A lot of rumors after that game on social media about something about a playbook or, or, or you see you knowing plays and calling out plays. Is that something that was was talked about amongst you guys after the game? Was that something that you think is legitimate that they may or may not have had some ability to know what play you plays you guys are running? So it's funny. It's funny you say that because. One of my uh, good friends now, he's a safety on UCF, Jair Wilson. He played at yeah. ECU. Yeah. And we also had a, a GA, a linebacker GA, Coach Mosa, come from ECU. So we all we all used to bring it up to him all the time. We're like, so y'all had our plays? Like, what was going <laughs> on? But I would say they do a great job of uh, of uh, switching the subject when that mm. happens. I, they haven't really – I really don't know the truth to this day. I really I really could not tell you. But, but you, I, you, sus you suspect maybe? I don't know. I would say they were very on our plays. I, I would either they had a great week of practice and they were just really <laughs> kind of in tune to what we were going to run on defense and offense. But uh, yeah, for to truth be told, I really don't know truly, truly if they had our plays or not. But I would say they, it, was, it was a little fishy though. It was a little fishy. <laughs> I would say if I, if I had to, if I had to say. That. We're on the same page, yeah. Yes, sir. They had, they had the <laughs> uh, another tough game that year later on is the Navy game. And you had probably your best game of the season. You had 11 tackles that day, a tackle for loss, a half a sack. But yes, how sir. frustrating is it to, to play so well yourself and then have the team come out on the wrong end? Uh, it's a little frustrating, but one thing that I always try to tell myself at the end of the day, it's, it's a, a team sport, you know what I'm saying? So – at the end of the day, yeah, you could you could do good, but ultimately the job is to to win the game. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I have, I have mixed feelings, I guess, when when stuff like that happens. If I have, if I personally have a good game, but the team loses, it kind of at that point I'm not even as happy about my performance because, like I said, I'm a big team oriented person. So I would say, at the end of the day, the team winning is is more important than how I do, for sure. Yeah, we ended up losing three of the last four games down the stretch. We almost lost the other game to, to South Florida there in the middle, too. Right, right. That was a crazy, crazy finish. <laughs> what what crazy happened, do you think, down at the end of the year? Because going into that Navy game, we looked like we were going to be a New Year's Six team. We were, we were right. playing pretty well, one seven out of eight, and then the wheels kind of fell off. Yeah, uh, I would say a, a thing that kind of goes – underplayed into the college football season is like towards the end of the season, I would say a lot of guys are a lot more banged up than they may seem, I guess. Like there's a lot of, and I give credit to, especially all my teammates at UCF, those dudes are some fighters for sure. Like every, every single one of them I've played with these last two years, like I know some dudes that had some real deal injuries, but they just kept going out there and just kept fighting for the team. So I would say that kind of plays a role into it a little bit. And, uh, and just a, a year of, a year of film too. Like a, if a team could watch like multiple games on you, kind of, they can kind of pick up some keys and kind of what you're trying to do. So I would, I would say that both those played a, a key part into us uh, losing those last couple of games. Let me, let me float a fan conspiracy theory past you. Okay. You can, you can either tell me it's uh, it's complete nonsense or okay. maybe if there's some credence to it. So a lot, a lot of fans nowadays in college football think that, as the season comes to an end, guys are starting to think about maybe their next move. Are they going to the portal? You know, right. NIL sponsorships elsewhere. Obviously, a bunch of team leaders on that defense end up leaving after that next year to, to go on to other places. D do you think there's anything to maybe some guys looking around thinking like, okay, hey, maybe I'll figure out what's next and not being as bought in or not being as invested in the team? 
Uh, I, I can see that. I can say uh, cer certain circumstances for sure. I would say because, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I guess as a college athlete, you're trying to make it to the next level. So I guess I'm, I don't agree with that personally. I would say I'm, I'm more of a person that uh, likes to finish what you started kind of deal. So if I start something, I, I like to finish it with the with the same school or whatever the case I'm doing. It's kind of why I stayed at Savannah State. Like I stuck out the whole four. I would have definitely could have left early, but I'm just a big believer of staying and finishing out strong. So, but in regards to those circumstances, I would say like, like I was saying, at the end of the day, people are trying to make it to the NFL. So I guess at some point you kind of got to do, that's the tricky part about college football. At some point you got to kind of do what's best for you and kind of yeah. what's going to elevate you and your game and help your family uh, achieve that success at the next level. Take us in the locker room, though. Well, what are the unwritten rules about that kind of stuff? Like, obviously, look, I mean, we're all adults here, right? I know guys yeah. are getting contacted by other people, right? There's there's rumors going around. What are the unwritten rules? Like, are our teammates talking openly about, hey, like, I heard about this, or someone told me about this, or, hey, so-and-so was in my DM about this? Like, or do you, is it just not talked about? It's something that no one talks about and no one really kind of brings up. Uh, I want to say it's that, that talked about in our, in our locker room because we got a we got a pretty – big family atmosphere at UCF. So I would say we don't really talk too, too much about next moves and all that stuff. Uh, we kind of try to keep the main thing, the main thing I would say. Uh, so a lot of that stuff, a lot of that stuff is really a, a surprise to me. Even if when guys leave or, or even uh, kind of have thoughts about leaving, that's kind of a, a big surprise to me. And I'm just as surprised as y'all are when they come out with the, uh, <laughs> the transfer portal posts and all that. I, I promise you, I'm just surprised. I'm like, man, I didn't know you were, you were going to leave. <laughs> Think about leaving, kind of deal. But uh, like I said, it's all, it's all I, I love at the end of the day. I got, I got, I got to push back on that a little bit. So you, your linebacker mate in year one, Jeremiah John Baptiste. So when you saw the graphic that you, that's the first time you thought hey, maybe he was moving on. Uh, the graphic with uh, with JJB moving on to leaving UCF, going to Ole Miss. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When I uh. Yeah, when I seen that, I, I kind of that kind of told me everything I needed to know. I guess if if he was gonna leave, but Gene's one of my one of my good buddies though. He uh he's actually my roommate. He was my roommate, so I will say in that case, I kind of I didn't know he was gonna leave, but we definitely did talk about like future plans, I guess. But that was just a special circumstance because that was like my roommate. That was probably one of the yeah. might have been the first person I met. When I got to UCF, I think when I moved into my room and all, he was probably the first person in there. Him and uh, Kamori Gamble hmm. and uh, Dylan Lester. Those are all like the first, those are my guys. Those are probably the first few people I met that uh, treated me like family when I first got to UCF. I would say. So, so the Matt Lee one was a head scratcher for you then? Yeah, the Matt Lee was a huge head scratcher. That was a huge head scratcher for me. <laughs> and I, I, I mean, I, Matt Lee's a, a great, great center too. I thought we could have, I think we could have used them this year. But he, he did great at uh, Miami, though, so that's, that's good for him, for sure. All right, so after last year, we got a change in defensive coordinator. T. Will leaves. He goes to Arkansas. Addison Williams steps in. What are some of the differences you notice, whether it's the style of play or the, the way they prepared you guys for the games? Any big differences there? Uh, any big di Yeah, I would say – yeah, I would say there's some pretty pretty big differences. Uh, For one, uh, Coach T. Will was a – a linebacker coach. So the stuff that we did when he was there was kind of more linebacker oriented in a sense, uh, more making it comfortable for linebackers to make plays. Not to say that coach Addy defense wasn't like that, but he's a DB coach. So a lot of the stuff we did schematically were kind of to help DBs out in a sense and, uh, help them like be more involved in different, uh, fits and stuff. But, I would say I love both their coaching styles, though. Like, they're uh, real cool coaches, like, real cool people to meet. Like, besides football, like, as a person, like, they're real cool people and uh, have the best interest for you as a player as well. Well, you think maybe that's part of the reason why the run defense maybe suffered a little bit this year as compared to last year? And maybe we did a little bit better against the pass? Oh, uh, with the run defense, I would say – the big thing with the run defense, I don't know. I would say that we were just kind of unfamiliar with what the Big 12 was going to bring. 
I know going into the season, we thought that the Big 12 was going to be more of a, a air raid passing kind of conference. So that was kind of what we prepared for going into the whole whole season, like during the summer, like we're working pass drops and we're working kind of different schemes passing wise that we could uh, discover and disguise uh, certain stuff. So when we got into the Big 12 for real, like we played Kansas State that first game, we kind of found out that we might have been completely wrong. It was really a, a run oriented, uh, one oriented conference. So that kind of caught us off guard. But I feel like as the season went on, we made a lot of improvements and fixed some stuff to really lessen lessen that run damage. I would say there were a lot of long road trips this year. You started out early in the year going all the way to Boise, Boise and then some long trips inside the Big Twelve. Any of that a factor? Is you guys get tired on those long trips? That, any negative effects from having uh, those? No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't really say that. I wouldn't really say those are uh, negative. If anything, that those are kind of that was cool. It was really cool to just go different places and like I've never been to uh, state of Kansas. Like I've never been out there. So going out there for the first time or going out to Oklahoma or even Boise State. Like you always dream of playing in that on that blue field, kind of as a kid, and just joking around and you play on NCAA, play on the blue field, but like actually seeing it in person. It was cool. But no, I, I wouldn't say the travel had anything to do with uh, any of the losses. I, I wouldn't put that on those. So you like the blue field? That thing that didn't give you a headache, man? Because I hate no, watching really, on the blue field. <laughs> I really did. I thought, I thought it was a very cool experience. I thought it was a real cool experience. Just, uh, yeah, I thought it was cool. The stadium itself is actually way bigger than I thought, too. I didn't think the stadium was going to be that big. But uh I thought it was a real cool experience, like the mountains kind of flying out there, the scenery and all that. It was cool. And there's no cool. problem seeing them in their blue uniforms. Everybody makes a big deal of that, how they're yeah. in the blue uniforms with the blue turf. No problems, you know, identifying. No, nah, no problem. Not as much of a problem as I thought it was going to be. The blues are kind of a little different. And the orange the orange kind of helps, too. So <laughs> I would say that the orange kind of sets them apart. But, yeah, well, I remember we were watching film, though. I was like, huh. I bet they come out in all blue, and they sure did come out in all blue. <laughs> as hard as they can try to, but no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it. You can tell the difference a little bit. It's not as it doesn't stick as much as it probably looks like on TV. All right, so I, I gotta ask. I guess this this falls to my question in the rotation. Well, I gotta ask mm -hmm. Baylor. I mean, yeah. what? Yeah. I, what happened? I guess I'll just <laughs> start with what, what what happened. Uh, um, Man, obviously a, a tough loss. Like what, what would you look back on that? What happened? What, what do you think kind of contributed to that? Uh, when I look back on Baylor, I would say the main thing is just a uh, complacency. I would say, I would say that, uh, cause I think we were on the losing streak before that. Yep. We lost a couple of leading up to Baylor. And I know like we were just so determined to like win the game and just go out there and just prove people wrong. So when we got out there and we jumped up so fast and I thought uh, we were all sitting there like, man, like, this is what we should have been doing the whole year. Like we kind of on the sideline, kind of underplaying it, I would say. And uh, I mean, y'all, I guess y'all saw what ended up happening. And I, I would say as much as that loss hurts, like I, I think about that loss close to, I wouldn't say every day, but definitely anytime somebody brings up the name Baylor, like that's probably the first, the first thing that pops into mind. So I would say that that loss taught us a very big lesson, though. Just you just can't. You got to finish. Like it, it's you can only do. It doesn't matter how much you play good for a quarter or a half, three quarters. Like you got to finish the entire game. And I I would say that was the biggest lesson I learned from that. I would probably take that game with me for the rest of my life. And I I will always heart while I'm finishing games for sure. From here on is, out. Is there is there one play that sticks in your mind when you close your eyes? Is there like one play you always see over and over again? Uh, Timmy, Timmy, fourth and fourth and thirty, or fourth and whatever that 20, was. He, I think it was twenty six. Yeah, twenty six. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Took off, turned around, ran to the back of the end zone, threw it to RJ. That was the craziest thing, just to kind of watch unfold. Because everybody's like, "No, what's going on with he Oh, he got a face <laughs> up happening. So it was cool, though. I, at that point, I thought we were gonna maybe get a little miracle again. I thought we were gonna make a miracle. Uh, save the day kind of deal. But unfortunately that wasn't in the, in the plans for that day. Take us in the locker room afterwards. Were guys mad? Were they upset? Were they sad? Like what was the, what was the atmosphere like in the locker room? 
mixed feelings. I would say a, a, a mix of all those mad, kind of sad, kind of like, kind of like, what's up? Kind of deal. Like, how do we keep just finding ourselves in these situations? Like, how do we just keep keep finding a way to just, I guess, ultimately lose games? But I would say that kind of brought us together as a team too, as well. Uh, kind of just to fight and just string along those last five games and just get some wins. So I would say uh, that game, that game is a big pivotal point for the season though. Cause I remember going into the, uh, the message that uh, coach Malzahn gave us. He was like, so I've been a part of teams that have started not so well like this, but it's the teams, like it's ultimately the team's goal, whether y'all want a full tent right now and we could just give up on the season or we could, make the best of this and learn from this and learn from our mistakes and make a bowl game towards the end of the year. And uh, we decided we were going to get together and uh, put together some wins to make it to a bowl game. So you guys, I mean, it was a five game losing streak. There's some tough losses in there. Obviously Baylor, is there one that hurts more than the other Oklahoma? And then oh, it wasn't yeah. in the five, the five game yeah, losing streak, but the Texas tech game was a tough one too, a one point loss. Yes, I would say, uh, besides the Baylor, I would say Oklahoma and Texas for sure. Uh, the Texas Tech game, for sure, that was a big loss because uh, <laughs> that one hurt because I thought we I thought we had such a good game game going up to it or played good during that game enough to win. And I, that game, too, was a game that had some weird calls, I would say, too, that kind of, I don't know if that set us back or not, but. Yeah, I would say the Texas Tech game and the Oklahoma, Oklahoma game just because uh, the Dylan Gabriel kind of story. And I thought it would have been cool to go to Oklahoma and upset them out there. That would have been real cool. You guys did get back to the wins. Like you said, the team did not quit. You go to Cincinnati, you win that one, and then you come home and you beat the hell out of Oklahoma State. Is that <laughs> the team we were expecting to see all year? Is that what you thought was going to be like yes. all season? Yes, sir. That is really the the UCF that we that we I would say should have been all year. But that's another thing. I don't know. We were kind of inconsistent. But that game, that game for sure, we had to like you said, we were gonna string along these games, and if we were gonna do that, we had to start. I want to say with Oklahoma State, and uh, that just leading up to that game, that was just a big a big game in general because we were just hearing about uh, Ollie Gordon all week and how. He was just going to run all over us and all this kind of stuff and how we just didn't have a run defense and there was no chance that we could stop him. Just kind of all this negativity and this – that was just the one game where we just had to put it together and just show that we're not we're not as bad as what people think. And we really are a great team, and I believe we showed that – or the potential to be a great team, and we showed that. Well, I want to get back to something you just said. So um, you mentioned Dylan Gabriel. You, you weren't even at UCF when Dylan Gabriel was at was at UCF, oh, but that was still a big game for you guys. That's still something that was talked about, like going yeah, in and, 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 and sort of getting about. some getting some payback at at the yeah. former quarterback. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely something that was uh, talked about. Just nothing uh, disrespectful, of course, but like just kind of he left and how the UCF fan base knows about Dylan and kind of it was just a big game leading up to it. So. Yeah, even though I wasn't even there, I still kind of felt the, I guess, the tension and how big of a deal it was to go out there and and uh, try to upset those boys. So, all right. Well, now now that you're, uh, um, you know, you're 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 off the team, you're free, you're moving on to the next. I can ask you an honest question. Okay. That Oklahoma play call, that two point conversion that uh, that we uh, ended up trying to uh, do a wide receiver pass with Xavier. Um, what, what were your thoughts on that play call? I mean, you've probably seen it run in practice. Do you think that was the – was that the right spot? Do you think that was the, the best call overall to have the, the a wide receiver charge for the ball versus Plumlee? Uh, I will say we do – we have run that play in practice before, and that play really has worked in, in practice. Uh, I would say – Maybe not the best time for it, but I would say like I'm. I don't know. I'm not a big play caller guy, so I don't know. I don't know what personally I would have called in that scenario, but I really don't. I don't hate the play call that much, really, as, as much as people think. Like, really, ultimately though, like X maybe could have been able to throw the ball at a point of time he would have had to throw it kind of soon. But uh, 
I don't know. I thought it was a, a tricky kind of play. And it's just it's funny though, because if it would have worked out, we would have been saying how oh man, yeah. like, that's a genius play, you know what I'm saying? Kind of deal. But uh this is one of those things like that's just how football is like. If you if you win, you're kind of that yeah. hero kind of dude. But then if it doesn't work out, it's like, why would you even think about doing that? <laughs> so, kind of yeah, that, that, one, that one's tough, though. I mean, we have R.J. Harvey, arguably the best running back in the Big 12 in the backfield. It, it's tough to not turn around and give it to seven and just let him let him do work there. No, 100%. 100%. I thought – I definitely – I personally thought we were going to call a wildcat right there or like a jump pass with R.J. or something like that. I don't know. We, we have been practicing that a little bit, but – uh yeah, I thought we were going to kind of lean in a different direction, for sure. But uh, like I said, if if we get that play, then Mr. Coach Malzahn's a hero if, if we do get that play. But unfortunately, it would be the other way. So when you guys were having that tough losing streak during the year, who were the guys on the team that kept everybody together, made sure you guys didn't quit? Who were the real leaders on this team? Oh, uh, real leaders on this team. I would say uh, – John Ross Pullman, who's I'm sure is obviously the obvious kind of leader guy. Um, I'll say John Rice, uh guys that I would say really the team is a collective, I would say. But if, if I had to say like some main people, I guess John Rice, uh drop drops a, a big influence on the defense, on just coming every day, just coming to work. Uh drop Sell Star, he's a big, he's a big leader as well. I would say uh Let's see. I really don't want to just single out people just because like the team kind of together kind of came came together and decided that. But uh because I don't want to leave anybody out. I know as a defense for sure, we we got together like all of us kind of decided like what we're gonna do and how we're gonna uh be thought of as the first big 12 UCS UCF defense. So but yeah, I, if I had to point out some main people, I would say John Rice. Uh, Josh, drop. Um, Jason, Jason's a big leader. He's not a big vocal guy, but he just leads by example. Just kind of how he just comes to work every day and all that. So, I mean, you see a guy come in and put in that kind of work. You want to match his level of intensity as well. So, uh, who else? RJ. RJ is a, was a big influence. Kobe, Javon. I just all those. Just like the the people that who we all think would be the leaders or kind of the main leaders to kind of help us get us back on track. Obviously a disappointing end to the year with the Georgia tech game. How would you grade the team overall? Do you think we were better than that six and seven record? If you had to give us a grade a to F overall for the season, what would you give us? Uh, yes, I do personally think what we put out the, the, the record that we put out, I think undershowed that UCF team greatly. Like I think we really could have been a, New Year's, like I said, crazy as it sounds, like a New Year's 16. Like I, I think that was the season that we wanted to have. That was the season we were kind of going in. That was our mindset, what we wanted to do. So, but ultimately, I, I would say we fell really short of that. Uh, if I had to give an honest, honest team grading, I would probably say, I'd say probably C plus C-ish. Just because I, I think, like I said, we had, we had talent, just too much talent, just too much talent. And uh, I just think we totally undersold Night Nation and all that. So I think about that all the time, just how what could have happened. But like I said, you, you, you live and you learn kind of with uh, football and all that. So, but yeah, I'd probably say C plus, C plus C, grade wise. Well, no, you're, you're a team first guy. How, how would you grade your season? 80 total tackles on the year, uh, one and a half tackles for a loss. How would you grade kind of your performance? Is it kind of set the standard, the goal you wanted coming in, or do you think you still left some plays out, out there on the field? Uh, so I was, I'm, I'm my, my biggest critic. So, yeah, I, I think I do left some plays out there. I think I could have had a little more than 80 tackles. But personally, just from my first year there to this year, uh, I feel like I was – showed a lot of growth just uh, on and off the field. But uh, I would say, personally speaking, I would probably give myself a – probably a B, B, B-plus maybe-ish. Because, uh, like I said, it, it was a 
I felt like I grew a lot going into my second year and showed kind of what I could do in a in a starting role. I would say. So uh, I would say, yeah, probably B B plus. Well, obviously, you made the decision to declare for the NFL draft. Of course, uh, what's next for you? Are, are you hiring a trainer? Are you going to you know d- different uh, different pro days, combine days? What's next for you in this uh, in the NFL draft process? Okay, so. I recently just got assigned with an agent. I signed with a pro star agency. Uh, I'm not too sure if y'all heard of them. They got some dudes that they got signed in the league. Uh, I'm trying to think. Alex Singleton is is the first one that kind of rings a bell to me. He's a linebacker, plays for the Broncos, I believe, right now. But that's just one of the guys they got signed. But uh, yeah, I recently just signed with them. I had a pretty good talk on the phone with them, and we kind of have an understanding of we're just trying to get to this next level and uh, they believe in me and I, I believe in them to get me there. So in regards to that, that's kind of what I got lined up right now with uh, my agent. Um, so really I'm back at home. I'm from Pensacola, Florida. So I'm back at home right now training. I got a, uh, I got a strength coach and I got a speed coach and I'm also got a, a drills. Uh, I don't see a coach. We're more like I go out with a, uh, some uh, college players as well. And we do like uh, drills and stuff just to kind of stay in shape for the uh, combine drills. But in regards to that, I'm just training at home, kind of got my own little self uh, plan, like Monday through Friday of where I kind of a mix of speed training and strength training and rehab and nutrition and just kind of all that. And uh, that's kind of what I've been doing recently for probably the last week or so that I've been here, just kind of getting back on schedule and just getting back to the best shape I could possibly be. But uh, what else? Uh, The pro day. So this year, I'm not too sure if y'all know, but instead of like it being school pro days, or at least for the Big 12, they're doing like a Big 12 pro day, like a conference ride pro day, which is going to be in March. And uh, I've been told I was going to get an invite to that. So basically I'm just training for that. And uh, that's kind of what the future entails of right now. And I'm just uh, putting my head down, working, and just seeing what opportunity is going to present itself, really. Have you gotten any feedback from from scouts or anybody on maybe things you got to work on? Or is there, is there something you specifically want to try to work on to sort of prove to, to scouts and coaches? Uh, so the one knock that I've kind of been hearing, uh, the major kind of been telling me, is that my size for the uh, linebacker position. I guess I'm not the ideal, like, Big, kind of big linebacker, I guess, and 240, 250 guy that the linebacker position is supposed to entail. But uh, I would say that's kind of my strong suit, too, though, because I feel like I I can not only play linebacker, but I can play in space, too, kind of like a, like a rover kind of spot-ish, I would say. So one of the things I'm going to try to work on to show teams is uh, just kind of get a little stronger, uh, faster, and uh, those are the main two things I'm trying to work on. My uh, my 40 and my 225 are like the two main things that I think if I, which I know I'm going to train hard for. So the results, the results are going to show. But I think those are the two things that are going to blow people away and uh, get some eyes on me towards uh, the draft. Is there a goal you have for the, the weights, like the bench press and the squat or anything like that? Uh, So for 225, my goal is 15. That's kind of the goal I've set myself at right now. I'm trying to do 15 or more. Uh, with the 40, so uh, UCF in the spring last year, I ran a 4-5. So I'm kind of trying to, my goal is to run a 4-4. That is the, the true goal is a 4-4, 4-5. I feel like if I do 225 15 times and I can run a 4-4, 4-5, I feel like I'll, I'll open some eyes up and I think I'll, uh, sneak on the radar for some of these NFL teams. And then what about, you've been in college for a long time, since 2018. You've yes, completely sir. graduated. You have a master's degree. You, where are you at with that? Uh, So if this football thing were to not work out, uh, my, uh, I want to be a sports, a sports agent, kind of start my own sports agency. It's kind of what I've always dreamed of doing if football didn't work out just because I want to stay involved in the game of football. So uh, I got my my uh, undergraduate degree in business management. So and I got my master's in uh, 
general studies or interdisciplinary studies. It, it depends on who's calling it. But uh, so with that, I kind of did media and message. So kind of just all three of those together, just start my own sports agency. And uh, I would just go from there and probably try to hire clients that I know, really, probably former teammates, really, is how I probably would start that off, just with famili familiarity and uh, just kind of go from there. But that's obviously – that's ultimately plan B. Plan A is for sure to go to the NFL and uh, see where that could take me. Bro, well, you've been really generous with your time, Walt, but uh, we we, uh, we end every interview around here with rapid-fire questions. Could be about okay. music, movies, sports, okay. anything random that's kind of on our minds. So are you prepared? These are going to be the hardest questions of the night. So okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, you said something earlier. I've got to ask you this question. You talked about John Weiss Plumley, and i got to tell you, Walt, the guy seems too good to be true. So tell me something about John. Does he smell? Does does he fart? Is he, like, got sloppy handwriting? There's got to be something this kid's not yeah, perfect that's at, funny, right? Uh, that's funny you say that because I – I get that a lot from uh, from friends and stuff. They're kind of like, there's no way that he actually acts like, like he's just that good of a dude or that cool of a person. I I promise you, I promise you, I can. Is he like, he is, is, he a bad, like is, is he a bad driver or something? Like, there's got to no, be something I, I, he doesn't I, do good. I'm telling you, he's one of those dudes in the locker room. He's got all his clothes folded up neatly in his locker. Like everybody else, kind of has their stuff all sprawled out on the floor. He's got his stuff kind of cleaned up. Uh, Got a bag that he keeps all his stuff in. I would say, uh, I'm telling you, I, truly, truly. Like, I, people ask me this all the time. They're like, there's no way he's like that. And I promise you, that is not an act. Like, he truly is just, that's just him. That's just Don Rice. So I think that kind of makes him him kind of deal. Does he snore? I mean, there's got to be something. Yeah. <laughs> this guy can't be that perfect. There's got to be something that he does. Uh, man, not not from from what I've seen of him. Nah, I, I don't nah, not from from I see him. He really is a, just just that guy. Kind of he doesn't he doesn't show me any imperfections. She was with his mouth open. <laughs> so got, you got to give me something here. There's, this is unbelievable. Uh, let's see if I had to if I had to say something. He's a uh, man. I'm trying to think. I don't. I truly like. I don't even. Mm hmm. I guess I don't know if a lot of people know he he sings a lot. I would say he's a big singer, like a big uh, he like sing to himself and stuff like that. I would say if I had to give something, but I wouldn't even say that's like a, a bad quality though, because he <laughs> he can kind of sing too. Like people probably don't even know that he's kind of a good singer. So like I I, I really I'm telling this you, is like, this is unbelievable. I need to I need to do some more research. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't know how many people know this about you, but you were born in Japan. Is that yes, true? Sir. So yes, sir. Do you speak true. any Japanese? I do not anymore. So I, so growing up, my dad was uh, stationed in the Marines. He did. He was in the Marines for twenty-seven years. So he was stationed out in Japan. And that's when they had me, and I lived out. And uh, I was born on base, but I lived in this city called Okinawa. And Okinawa, Japan, is. On base, it's really a lot like Florida. If I really truly had to describe it, it's a lot like Florida. Just the weather and kind of the people and the atmosphere and all that. And uh, so growing up, we had to take like cultural classes, like in elementary school and stuff. You had to take like a culture class and a language class. And they kind of taught you how to do origami and make sushi and all sorts of stuff like that. So I don't, I say all that just to say at a period of time, like that was like, I had to know that, like I had to learn how to count and say certain words. I do know like uh Ohio Gazimas. That means good morning. Ohio Gazimas means good morning. Uh Kenichiwa is kind of like good afternoon, but it can also mean like what's up? Uh let's see. Let's see what else I might know. I used to be able to count in Japanese. I might know I know I think it was Ichi ni san See, she Roku. I, I, those could be wrong. Those could be wrong, but I definitely got five. I definitely get the five for y'all. I think I can get the five for y'all. said Nissan and Roku. That, those are the yeah. car and then the, the TV. app on my TV. TV and car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a, you could have said anything and we would have, we would have believed you there. Yeah. Well, all right. Here's my next one about your teammates. This is a true or false. Jason Johnson. Jason was he Johnson. purposely tr was he purposely trying to say as few words as possible in press conferences? True or false? <laughs> was he purposely false? That is just him. 
he is not a very – I will say, though, it, just me, my personal relationship with Jason, because we came in at the same time. So we used to uh, – he's my workout partner, really, like, at, throughout both years. Like, he's always worked out with me and just being linebackers and stuff. So I would say my relationship with him is a lot different than – probably a lot of other people but i would just say that's just him though he's not a very big talkative person i would say not even to me though like even if i talk to him he'll, he'll give me a couple words but it'll just be a couple more words than y'all might get <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's only a couple words for sure all right the nfl playoffs are about to kick off who do you like going to the super bowl and are you a fan you have a, a specific a, team you're a fan of yeah personally i'm an eagles fan Oh no! We have not. Oh, yeah, no. We, yeah, that's been rough. <laughs> that's been rough. I'm a Giants <laughs> fan and Adams an e, uh, Cowboy fan, so. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> like yeah. That's, that's a bad yeah. combo. We got a, a bad <laughs> mix right here. Right now. It's not. It's not good. No. Yeah, we just need a, a Commanders fan. We got. We got the whole division. <laughs> I don't think they have very many of those. Yeah. I think we're we're safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, too we're many safe. of those, though. I'm gonna say not too many of those. But uh, who do you like? So, uh, Super Bowl? I'm a big Eagles fan, but honestly, the. From what I've been seeing recently, I think uh, the Ravens, the Ravens might get it done this year. Lamar, Lamar's been playing pretty good. He's been playing pretty lights out, and they got a good team. They got a real good defense, real good defense, and they they've been playing pretty good as uh, these last couple of weeks. But you, I will say, you never know though. The Eagles, I, I wouldn't count the Eagles out though. We'll see. I wouldn't count them out. We'll we'll see. Hopefully, we pull it together. I hope we don't go out at least in the first round of Tampa. I hope I hope that's not the way we go out, but. If it is, it is, unfortunately. All right. Well, if you're if you're listening to this on on audio, you don't know this, but behind you, Walt, you have what looks like a guitar, and I don't know if that's a violin or something behind you. So, <laughs> yeah, do, yeah. You, do you do you play those instruments, or do you have like a, a hidden talent that people don't know about? Uh, I do not play the guitar, but I guess a hidden talent. When I was a kid, when I grew up, uh, this is in Okinawa too. This is when I was in Japan. My uh. My parents used to make me do recitals. I used to play the piano. I used to be really, really good at playing the piano. Like I, to the point where I could like read music and not even have to look at the keyboard. Like I could just read music and play. And that's one thing I really want to get back to doing though. Like I, I used to be really good. I used to go to like recitals and like play in front of play in front of a couple hundred people and like do a little show. And uh I used to take like piano lessons and all type of stuff. So that was I would say is a hidden gift. I did not play the guitar. I did not used to play the guitar. But piano, All right. Piano well, sure. this helps me then. True or false? You're a better piano player than John Rice Pumley. <laughs> false. Oh. False. False, Man. false, false. That man, that man can play. I can't play. Uh, Unbelievable. I used to play like piano songs, if that makes sense. Like piano oriented songs. That man can play like real deal, like songs, like songs that you might hear on the radio kind of deal. I'm not going to lie. If I would have, if I would have stuck with it long enough, I might have been able to. I, I like might have this, been able yeah. to compete with him, I would say. Okay. So I, I wouldn't okay. count myself out, though. <laughs> okay. I wouldn't count myself out. All right. I'm sure you've seen the videos, but down here, I'm in South Florida. In okay. Miami, there was a video coming out on New Year's Day with some aliens walking around at, at a Bayside Marketplace, or supposedly aliens. Right. Do you believe that there's a possibility that, maybe not that, but aliens could be among us? Oh, man. With, this, with the world nowadays, I... I really would not be surprised if that if that were a real thing. I myself don't believe in aliens, but I guess they say you really like you can't believe in something until it's proven, kind of deal. So I guess that kind of does give somewhat a proof. So I, I am I have been curious. I have been curious. I haven't personally seen the video, but I have been seeing a, a bunch of like remarks on Twitter about it, just kind of about how there might be alien life and all that. It's kind of crazy to think about if that is a, a true true thing though it's a weird video there's like yeah. eight thousand police cars and for some reason not one of the police officers is out of the car walking around which is, yeah. is a little well, hmm. i don't know i don't know i'm not saying it's aliens but i'm not saying there's not right it's, just, it's some weird stuff going on though <laughs> what, are the, what are the police gonna do like arrest the aliens i mean they were all too scared to get out of the car i think i mean i'm not getting out of, I'm not getting out of my car if there's an alien no, outside no, right, 100%. I, I would need it i would need that it just makes me believe that there was an alien walking around <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 hard to disprove that. Um, Walt, who on the team does the best impression of Coach Gus Malzahn? Ooh, uh, my dog uh, Grant. My dog Grant, Grant Reddick or uh, Grant Stevens? Grant Stevens, the tight end. Grant Stevens, okay. the tight end. Yes, we uh. So it's funny when every year before the before the season, there in fall camp, we have a uh, 
I'm not gonna lie, Randy Pittman does a, a crazy good impression of, of Gus Malzahn too. <laughs> a very, because I, I was about to say uh, during fall camp we do this uh, uh, a new player newcomer skit. Like all the newcomers got a uh, all the newcomers got to do a skit, and it'll normally be like uh, making fun of like a team meeting kind of day. And I remember last year, the first year I got there, Grant Stevens did a, a Gus Malzahn impression, and that was very like almost the glasses on all the type of stuff had a little board like he real deal has like he's been practicing almost like he like he was waiting for that moment for a while and then uh then this past year randy happened to be uh coach malzahn and i would say he, he did a really good job too like with the voice and all that so if i had to give the two best impression impersonation i'll say randy Pittman and uh, grant stevens Sure. What's the key to a good Gus Malzahn impression, though? In your mind, what do they have to do? Like, what's the key to a good impression of Gus? Ah, uh, because he does a lot of old sayings. Like he, uh, <laughs> like just like his persona. Like you just have to, just kind of his mannerisms and kind of how he acts. Uh, but he does, he does have a lot of old sayings. Like he'll, he'll stay, say stuff. Like he doesn't cuss. So that's a big part too. So like, if you do impersonate Gus, you can't cuss. Like he says crap a lot. Or, uh, let's flat get after these guys. Yeah, let's get after these guys. Yeah, stuff like that. You gotta do boom, you gotta do boom, and all that stuff. So just he's got certain stuff and certain stuff he says like before team meeting. Like before team meeting, I'd say almost almost every day he's gonna come in and he's gonna be like, "All right, guys." So every every time, uh, every time those. Uh, Skits were done. That's kind of how they always started off the meeting. They'd be like, all right, guys, <laughs> got to go on about the day. And that's just stuff like, just little stuff like that, though. All right. Your name, Walter Yates the Third. Yes, if sir. you one day have a son, is it automatic? It's going to be Walter Yates the Fourth? Automatic. Automatic. <laughs> and if I have twins, I'm going to have four and five. Oh, it's not, not for real. Not real. That's real. That's real. That's real. That's real. Definitely four, though. I definitely got to have four, though. 100% I got to have four. Do you, do you have a nickname? I do. Trey. Trey's my nickname because Uno does Trace. So, on the third. So, my family calls me Trey. Really, that's really what my family calls me. My family really doesn't call me Walt for the most part. They call me Trey. You mentioned uh, Twitter earlier, and, and I'm curious, uh, Walt, how – how much restraint does it take for you to be on Twitter and see a comment from a fan about something like UCF's linebacker suck or we need better <laughs> linebacker. How hard is it not to respond to stuff like that? So it's, it's funny you say that I'm more of a, I really don't get on Twitter as much as I would say Instagram, but I'm really not a big, I get on social media, but uh, I try not to pay attention to, to that stuff for sure. But I will say, uh, my boy Jason. Jason does keep big receipts on that stuff. Like that, that stuff fuels him to the like if I see any kind of linebacker bash, I saw it from him or like he sent it to me. I'd be like, man, that's what they're saying. So like if I do see it from Jason, and Jason keeps notes on that kind of stuff. And that kind of stuff just fuels us just to make us better. I don't like I said, I try not to pay too much attention to it though, because uh Gus does a good job about that too. Coach Mazan, he always says, uh kind of stay true to yourself. Like, don't don't let those outside people kind of get into what you got going on. Because if you let if you let somebody else tell you how you are, in a sense, like, you, you should, shouldn't let that happen. You should always just be true to yourself and just kind of deter all the outside noise. So he's really good at kind of emphasizing that, though, like kind of staying on social media and just avoiding the outside noise and just everything we need isn't here kind of deal. All right, what's been your favorite places to hang out in right around campus? Yeah, go to spot. Cool places to hang out around campus. So I'm a big uh let's say Hugh Magoos. I'm a big Hugh Magoos fan. Huge Hugh Magoos fan. I'm a big uh those chicken tenders real good. Real good chicken tenders. Uh let's see. Other than that, Bar Louie. I recently was going to Bar Louie kind of towards the end of the season, they have a really good happy hour with wings. Like they have these uh, boneless wings you can get for like half off and some flatbreads and stuff you can get. And the atmosphere, they got a bunch of TVs in there and uh, it's not too far from campus. So that would say that's a pretty cool 
place to go chill and if you're talking about watch a game or something. Uh, other than that, though, I really I didn't go out too too much most of the time. If if I did go out, it might have been on the weekend, but not really though. I, I'm a more of a in person like after practice, I'll just come home, kind of chill with the teammates, we'll just be on the game. We're we're big Madden, big Madden and 2K guys at uh, the UCF, so we we play a lot of Madden. Well, it's like I get made fun of a lot. I love Hugh Magoo's, but I, I go lemon pepper sauce. Is that is that good? Is that okay? Like, is that a good order? That's not a bad order. I mean, I mean, you okay. can, if that's if that's your if that's your thing. Me personally, I get ham breaded, and I get the I get the ham bread, and I get the Magoo sauce yeah. and the sweet heat on the side. Okay. Yeah, I was going never, lemon pepper. I've never got a sauce though. You might have to. I'm gonna have to try that out. It's Next it's time. legit. Give it a shot. I also revealed recently on one of our shows that I've never had a Dr Pepper. And people think that's weird. Have you ever had Dr. Pepper? Yeah, is it good? I've, had I've Dr. never Pepper had it. Before. Is it good? It is good. It is good, I would say. What? Like, never in your life you've had a Dr. Never Pepper. in my life. What does it taste like? So someone described it to me as, uh, like, a Diet Coke with a splash of Robitussin. Like, what, is, what does it taste <laughs> like? <laughs> that's interesting. That is a very interesting uh, description. Uh, man, I had to describe Dr. Pepper. I would just say it's a... Uh, So you've had a, a Coke, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big Coke fan. Yeah, Cherry Coke, Coke Zero, Root Beer. Just never had a Dr Pepper. Just Dr. Pepper. I would say, honestly, Coke is. I mean, Dr Pepper is kind of like a a sweeter Coke. I would say, if anything, kind of. Yeah, I haven't had one in a while though. I, if I do drink soda, I'm not too big of a soda guy. But if I do drink soda, I'm a big Sprite guy. Sprite, so I like Sprite. I but I would say if I had to describe the last time I had Dr. Pepper, I would say it's kind of a sweeter Coke. But I will say I'm not the biggest fan of Dr. Pepper, so I don't okay. I don't blame you. I don't blame you on not, okay. not drinking it. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I always thought it was a root beer. I, I don't think I've had a Dr. Pepper in like 35 years. If I even if I've had one, I, I, it's been no, a, it's been a minute for me. To, I would say if I had a Dr. like the last time I had one was probably as a kid for sure. Right. The only thing I know about Dr. Pepper is when I watch the um, the bowl games and they have the Dr. Pepper thing that kids are throwing footballs in and mm-hmm. they're chest passing those things in versus throwing. Yeah. That's the only thing I know about Dr. Pepper is they have the giant right. cans. Right. The little uh, the little $1,000 thing you can win. Yeah, the chest pass, no good, right? Well, yeah. do, you, do you laugh at people with the chest pass or is that smart strategy on your part? I would say if you're not good at – if you can't throw the football, I don't see how, the, the, I don't see how that could be a, a bad method, Honest, honestly. If if it's you though, you going are you going overhand or are oh, you yeah, going? going overhand. Okay, yeah. yeah, I'm going overhand. I'm going yeah. overhand. No, no time for right. that chess pass. Yeah. The uh, national championship game right now is at halftime. Michigan's up seventeen ten. Does Washington come back and, and pull it off, or Michigan holds on? Ooh. So, I've had mixed I've had mixed feelings kind of about this whole college football playoffs, but uh, with this game, I would say I'm a I'm a big uh, Michael Penix fan. So I think I like his story, kind of just how he's kind of just been hurt all these years and he uh, finally got his one year and he's kind of getting a, a, the breakthrough that he always really needed kind of deal. So I, I hope they do pull it off. I hope they do pull it off. But Michigan's got a cool story too because really nobody thought they were going to make it here. So the fact that they're here just proving everybody wrong in a sense. So, But I do hope, I do hope Michael Penix and them pull it off and make the comeback. All right. Well, we'll get you out here in this last question. Uh, it's 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 uh, it's clear talking to you tonight. How how much uh, you know coming to UCF means to you? What what have these last two years meant to you? Being at UCF and what does it mean to you to sort of leave out and 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 get a second degree as a, as a UCF Knight? Um, in all honesty, these last two years of UCF mean honestly everything to me. As uh, like I said, when I uh, even just kind of coming out of high school, I always wanted to go play D1 football and play on that level and just be on TV, ESPN, just have people be able to watch me play. And uh, I went to Savannah State out of high school, so our games were on like ESPN+. Plus. So you kind of got to buy a whole separate channel and all this kind of stuff just to get on TV for people even to watch it. So the opportunity that UCF gave me just to get myself out there and just advance my education and all that, it, it really means the world to me, to be honest. Like UCF – Definitely, like, I'm very uh, thankful, very thankful that they took an opportunity on me out the portal. And uh, I really 
truly wouldn't change it for the world. Like if I had to redo it again and go somewhere else, I would choose UCF for sure. Well, we're glad you chose UCF. You again, you were a great representative on the field, off the field, and uh, I know a bunch of people are rooting for you to to get to the next level, and and uh, we'll certainly cheer you on wherever that is. But we appreciate you taking some time to uh, to join us on the show tonight. Yes, sir. I appreciate y'all for uh, having me on here. It's been a been a fun time. All right. Well, go Knights. Yes, sir. Charge on.